Hi, my name is Lewis McCaffrey. I'm a senior research scientist at the Department of Environmental Conservation in Syracuse, New York. And I'm going to go through a little presentation about harmful algal blooms and whether hydraulics is uh, one of the ways that we can solve this problem that is plaguing uh, New York State, uh, the US and the world. So what I'm going to be talking about is a definition of harmful algal blooms, the ways that we can remediate blooms, uh, some of the hydraulic uh, properties of algae, and then I'm going to lay out to you the challenge. So harmful algal blooms, what are they composed of? Well, they're composed of algae. There are so many different kinds of algae. They're all single celled plants. They possess chlorophyll and they conduct photosynthesis with that uh, green pigment. The cyanobacteria are uh, problematic. They have some accessory pigments, phycocyanin and phycoerythrin. Where does this uh, acronym come from? Well, harmful algal blooms are harmful from the point of view of toxins. They generate some toxins to compete with other organisms. If you have a harmful algal bloom in your lake, for instance, it's going to decrease the property values around there. They don't look very nice and they can also have some ecological effects, even without toxins, because once they die, they rob oxygen from the water. They're mostly made of algae, but specifically cyanobacteria are not true algae. And they become a bloom when there is a proliferation of cells. Uh, to very high concentrations. That concentration is not very well um, agreed upon across the US and across the world. But you'll know it when you see it. So these blooms occur in lakes with high nutrients, for instance, phosphorus and nitrogen, um, but they also seem to occur in low nutrient lakes, like the ones that we have around central New York, the Finger Lakes, and also in Lake Placid. So the causes are not fully understood, but we're certainly getting closer to it. High temperatures uh, in the water, still weather allow the uh, algae to come up to the surface. Zebra mussels and quagga mussels have been implemented, uh, sorry, implicated in their prevalence as well. What kind of cyanobacteria do we have? Well, there are many different kinds, but the ones that we see most of all in central New York uh, Dolichospermum and Aphanozemenon, these are able to fix nitrogen and so they don't rely on nitrogen in the water. They produce anatoxin, which is a, a nerve toxin. And then microcystis on the right hand side there is uh, able to adjust its buoyancy. That means that it's able to rise up and down through the water column in order to adjust its exposure to light levels. This is a very common cyanobacteria, it produces the toxin microcystin, which is a potent liver toxin. When do these, uh, um, when do these algae and cyanobacteria arrive? Well, uh, you can see that we have diatoms and dinoflagellates. These are often uh, silica uh, fixing organisms f throughout the winter. And then in early summer, we have the green algae, and later in the summer, towards fall, we have the cyanobacteria. Peak algae season or peak hab season is August to September. Uh, I won't go into the toxins too much, but uh, just to tell you that anatoxin, when it was first found, was also known as very fast death factor. So these are highly potent toxins. And this is the reason why we don't want uh, harmful algal blooms around our recreational areas. This is what a bloom looks like from a drone. You can see uh, generally the water is green, but there are uh, brighter green pat patches around. Up close, you'll see that there are streaks and even closer there'll be filaments. And they often are congregated around beaches where they have been drifted by gentle breezes. It's not just a New, New York problem. They're also found across the states and internationally, particularly in Lake Taihu in China, that's a, um, a very well-known example. 
So what can we do about these halves? Well, what we're trying to do, and DEC has been working on this for decades, is to reduce the amount of nutrient in uh, lakes by keeping nutrients on the landscape. But once that has happened and we start to have harmful algal blooms in our lakes, what can we do to remediate them? There are many methods that have been attempted, the use of ultrasonic devices to disrupt uh, al algal cells, hydrogen peroxide or other general algae sides, hypolimnetic mixing, which is trying to mix the algae, si algae cells down into the bottom of the lake where they can't photosynthesize, um, the extraction of cells using flocculation, um, hydrodynamic cavitation, which I'll go into in a moment, uh, and electrochemical oxidation filtration, which is used to produce um, oxygen and chlorine radicals in the water. And then an ecosystem manipulation, which has really, I think, only been attempted in theory. I don't think anybody's actually tried to do that. Now, SUNY ESF has been active in this field, um, and ESF is actually part of the Center of Excellence in Healthy Water Solutions, it was started by our current governor, uh, Andrew Cuomo. ESF and Clarkson University up at Potsdam are uh, co-chairs. And you can see some of the professors there that are uh, leading the uh, endeavor. <clears throat> and the challenge to try and mitigate HABs. So these are some of the devices that were produced. Clarkson's efforts involved electrochemical oxidation and filtration, and they were put on a uh, regular, <clears throat> excuse me, pontoon boat. ESFs were uh, slightly larger, and they tried to use uh, hydro hydrodynamic cavitation, which produced nanobubbles um, to try and burst the flotation cells inside the cyanobacteria. Now, we did as a DEC measure the efficacy of these two systems. And what we found was that the effluent from Clarkson was slightly less green than that from SUNY ESF. But ESF's system uh, had a delayed action of up to 72 hours. And what we noticed, and this is the reason why I'm asking you about this, is that <clears throat> Settlement over a long period of time seemed to be the most effective way of taking out cyanobacteria from the water. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it, but the effluent or the lake water after 72 hours of settlement was crystal clear. Uh, this was some of the results. We actually measured the amount of chlorophyll in the effluent from both of these systems as a measure of how much cyanobacteria was still present. And ESFs, um, unfortunately, the immediate reduction was not statistically significant uh, from the influent intake of the water coming into the device. Clarkson's, we were able to measure a significant reduction. Um, but after 72 hours of settlement, both uh, effluents from the uh, systems had very appreciable reduction in, in zooplankton. And this is where we come to the idea that settlement using gravitation would possibly be a way of removing or reducing the amount of cyanobacteria in lake water. So the hydraulics of these algae, let's have a look at it. Algae do uh, settle out naturally, as we've seen, but they are very slow uh, under Earth's gravity, just one millimeter to 2.6 centimeters per hour. Of course, it's faster uh, with flocculation if you can cause these algae cells to uh, clump together. But we want to try and avoid adding any extra chemicals to the system because one, that costs more, two, it is a bit of uh, extra work, quite a lot of extra work to get the permits to allow us to do that in a lake. We also have to consider that uh, some of these forms of cyanobacteria are able to control their buoyancy. So it could be that these algae 
float slightly. And centrifugation or use of a centrifuge is possible about um, 4,500 revs per minute. And I'm not quite sure what the gravitation is on that. So it's also possible to centrifuge uh, lake water um, at around four and a half thousand revs per minute. I'm not sure what the g-forces are for that. Um, for up to 10 minutes, this is a standard laboratory practice, um, but it's not really useful for um, you know bulk processing of lake water. So it occurred to me that the alternative method might be the use of a hydrocyclone. And these are devices that use density contrast and centripetal force to separate out um, different phases of fluids, including gases and, uh, and liquids. So they widely used in industry. Um, and I came across them, first of all, in mineral separation. Um, but they're used in quarries to separate sand from water. And uh, the background on this Wikipedia is surprisingly good on the subject. I wouldn't normally recommend Wikipedia, but it is good on this one. And the way that they work is that water and the slurry comes in at the top. It enters into the device uh, on the side. And so that causes a vortex to form. The denser material is forced out to the edge. And as it moves down the cone, um, the vortex gets tighter and tighter. And then there is a return flow up to the top. And what happens is the um, material that is rejected, if you like, uh, comes out the bottom. And that would be the sand in this case. And the material that is accepted goes out through the overflow. And in this case, it would be water with potentially a little bit of fine sand in it. So uh, my son Andrew put this neat little uh, 3D view together and this is what it looks like in three dimensions. Now the different dimensions of the hydrocyclone are some of the most important aspects of it. The, the size of the input pipes and output pipes, the angle of the cone, and so on. These are parameters that can be played around with. The input uh, for this device in this challenge would be lake water. And lake water would be fresh water, and it would have a certain amount of cyanobacteria in it. Now, the actual density of that cyanobacteria, it's the problem is that it's around uh, one grams per cc. And so it is a very fine uh, separation that is required. Okay, so the challenge. The challenge is to try and do some cyanobacteria remediation. Hi, my name is Lewis McCaffrey. And that brings us to the challenge. So what we're interested in trying to find out is, is it possible to use the concept of cyclonic separation to separate out cyanobacteria from water. Uh, that would ultimately result in the removal of cyanobacteria, or at least an increase in the concentration of cyanobacteria in one of the outputs. Critically, we want to ensure that the cells are not burst, so there should not be very high shear forces because those would release toxins. And a target operating rate would be around 50 gallons per minute. And so we think that possibly by changing some of the parameters in the design of a uh, hydrocyclone may be able to get us closer to some kind of separation. Okay, well, thanks very much for listening. My name is Lewis McCaffrey again, and uh, you can see my email. Please get in touch with me if you have any questions or suggestions some references that I used to put together this presentation and that may be of use to you in uh, trying to solve this challenge. Uh, remember, ESF was awarded uh, several hundred thousand dollars in order to try and solve this problem. So 
there are definitely rewards beyond the academic to try and uh, sort out this major worldwide issue. Thanks and good luck.